If you do not have your Bible, they will be putting it up on the screen here in a moment. But Luke chapter number 7, and we're going to start looking at verse number 40. And here we see Jesus has been invited by this Pharisee to his house. And this Pharisee has Jesus there with all these other people. And Jesus is just kind of hanging out. And this lady comes walking in. The Bible says that she was a lady that had lived a sinful life. It's the way the Bible says that she had lived a sinful life. Open for your interpretation what that means, but what we know is the Pharisees who were very strict religiously wanted nothing to do with people who had lived a sinful life. So she comes walking in and she's crying so hysterically that her tears actually are enough to wet Jesus' feet. She's crying so hard that her tears wet Jesus' feet. And then she pours out this alabaster box of expensive perfume all over Jesus' feet, washes them with it, then uses her hair to dry his feet. And this Pharisee sees this in his home, and he's like disgusted. He sees this lady doing this, and he's disgusted by what she's doing. And the Bible says that he actually says to Jesus, if you really were who you say that you are, then you would never have let her do this. If you really were Jesus, then you never would have let this lady who is sinful come in and wash your feet with this expensive perfume. And Jesus looks at him and basically says, the opposite of that is true. Because I am Jesus, that's exactly what I'm going to allow happen. And it says, starting at verse number 40, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. So what I love about Jesus, he, he could tell when people didn't understand. He could tell when people didn't get the point. So Jesus said, you know what, instead of just saying, I'm just going to leave it, you're going to just be toast, whatever. He would say, okay, I want to help you understand. So Jesus would break it down into stories, into what were called parables. And that's what he does here. He says to Simon to make a point. I have something to tell you. And Simon says, tell me, teacher. And Jesus says, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the student loan debts and the car debts and the credit card debts and the mortgage debt. Thought y'all might get a little bit excited about that. Now, which of them will love him more And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. Now I got to point something out because I don't know if anybody ever has. I know that he's Jesus, but these are still feet. Like, I know that he's Jesus, and he probably, like, his feet are smooth. He has no bunions, nothing like that. But he's still been walking in the dirt in sandals. He's still been walking on these dirt roads, y'all. And this lady has been kissing his feet. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand if you'd be willing to do the same thing mainly because I wouldn't be able to raise mine. Said, you did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that e who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Her faith, it was not what she did, it was why she did it. It wasn't exactly what she did, but it was the reasoning behind why she did it. He said, your faith has saved you. Now, can you picture being in this experience? Can you picture being in this moment? Jesus is there, and he's Jesus, and he's been invited to the Pharisee's house, and he's hanging out, and this lady comes in crying so hysterically that she wets his feet 
with her tears. That's how much she was crying. I don't know if you've ever had a time in your life where something just hit you so hard that you were just boo-hooing. I mean, like, just, like, you couldn't stop crying. Like, Judah will do this sometimes where he, he I'm like, breathe, bro. Like, he stops breathing. It's like, <laughs> you know, like, it's just, it's, it's this crazy cry. She's crying so much that her tears are wetting his feet in front of all these people who do not like her, who do not think she's supposed to be there, who do not think that she has any business even being in the building. She doesn't care. She goes in front of all of them. She's crying so hard at Jesus' feet. She wets his feet. She per, pull, pulls out this perfume oil out of an alabaster box that's super expensive, throws it on his feet, dries them with her hair. Can you imagine this? And I don't mean like you imagine it like we just read it in the Bible. I mean, put yourself there. You're in the room. You're a fly on the wall. And this lady comes in and does all these things. Like if you're actually there, you would honestly, when she walked in, you'd be like, whoa. What's she? Hey, hey, what, what's she? is that it? Is that Susie? That's Susie. I, last time I saw her, she was on the street earlier today. I don't know what she thinks she's doing in this place. Like she don't de deserve to be in here. And then, oh, no. Oh, oh, she's touching his feet. Oh, she did that. She just touched, she's, she's kissing, y'all, she's kissing his feet. We knew she was crazy, right? We knew she wasn't all there. But like, this is next level. She is kissing this stranger's feet. She don't know him. She don't know where those feet been. Kissing his feet. And it, now, how did she afford that box of alabaster oil? How, now, I know how she afforded it, but I ain't gonna say it. I'm gonna let somebody else say it for me. I know how she got that. This is what it was like, and this lady comes in. And she's in this moment and Jesus says, no, 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 you don't understand it because you take me for granted. See, Jesus said it's not about what she did, it's about why she did it. See, when we forget why we worship, it affects how we worship. When we remember why we worship, it also affects how we worship. So for this last week of How I Fight, I wanna to talk to you on the subject Remember why. Remember why. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today, and we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for who you are. If you never did anything else for us, you've been good to us. And Lord, I pray that for these next few moments, Holy Spirit, you would speak to each and every one of us in this room, that you would help us to see from you, to hear from you. Lord, I know that we can all come from different backgrounds, different areas, different struggles but that you can use the same words to penetrate our hearts in different ways. I pray that you would help them not to see and to hear from me, but to only see and hear what you have to say. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Now, have you ever done this before? Have you ever done something for someone specifically expecting a certain response? Like you did something for them and you were expecting them to respond or react a certain way. We, we do this all the time, like, like, you know, the husband will bring home flowers, and if it doesn't win over the wife, it's like, well, I thought that you would get all happy. Like, what, the fine, I'm taking the flowers back. They cost me 10 bucks anyway. Like, you do things expecting a response, because the truth is, a lot of what we do is for the reaction. It's for the, the response. A lot of what we do, if we're truly honest, is not really the heart behind it, but it's about the response that we can get for it. So this was a couple of years ago when we first moved into our new house. My, my wife and I, we had this field behind our house, and it had grown up, but I didn't have a lawnmower. So I'm like, okay, well, I got to start saving to get a lawnmower. So for a couple of months, this field keeps growing while I try to find a lawnmower that runs, that rides. I ain't trying to push. That costs less than 100 bucks. And so... It took me a couple months, and then finally it got so bad I realized it wasn't going to happen. I had to break down, and I got this lawnmower, and my wife was going away to, to hang out with some friends for the day. They were doing some shopping for the babies or something like that, and, and I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to cut the grass today, and when she gets home, she's going to be impressed because I'm not even going to tell her I'm going to do it. She's just going to show up at the house. She's going to see the field behind the house. is all beautiful and cut. It's going to be amazing. So I go out there on the hottest day of the year, and I spent about three hours cutting the grass. I don't cut grass. Like, I, I just, I'd never done it really in, in years before this moment. So I cut this grass, and, and I'm feeling good about myself because it looks good. 
right? You know how the worse something looks before you address it, the better it looks afterwards? Yeah. Right? Like, like me after the Rogaine kicks in, it's going to be like, whoa, big difference. It's amazing. <laughs> so that's what the yard was like. It was like, it was so grown up. Okay, y'all can stop laughing at that now. It was so grown up <laughs> that, that it looked terrible. But now that it was all cut down, it looked amazing, and it looked that much better. So Nicole got home, and I went walking out to her, and I was in a tank top. And some people call them muscle shirts, but if you don't have muscles, it's a tank top. So I was in a tank top, and I go walking out to her, strutting my stuff, right, because she's going to see this amazing cut field, and she's going to be so impressed. And I go walking out to her, and I'm expecting her to say, oh, my gosh, the field looks amazing. But when I see her, she says, hey, good looking in your muscle shirt. I was like, don't patronize me. I know it's a tank top. <laughs> Y'all don't have me fooled. But she didn't even say anything about the field. Nothing. Not, not like, not a word. So I said, um, <clears throat> babe, did you see the field? She looks and she's like, oh, yeah, it looks good. No, it looks great. It looks amazing. Like, this is the best thing. So I was so disappointed in her response because she's just like, it looks good. So I get quiet. That's what I do. And she's like, well, you know, hey, what's, what's wrong? What's bothering you? I can tell something's wrong. And I was like, you didn't even say anything about the field. I busted it cutting that field, and you didn't even see it. You didn't even care. And she said, well, I told you you look good in your muscle shirt. And I was like, I got feelings. I'm not a piece of meat. I want to know that you're proud of what I did, that the field looks good, right? Like I was so disappointed in her response. Fast forward just a couple weeks ago, she was gone again, and I vacuumed the entire house. <laughs> Three hours vacuuming the entire house. Now, I vacuum sometimes. I don't like to vacuum, but I do it sometimes just to help out. But I, I, I'm not like, I'm not very good at it because I don't have the patience for it, so I'm just like, you know, like this. But I took my time with it, and I did a good job. And she comes in the house, and she sees the marks in the carpet. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, it can be dirty, but if it's got lines in it, they think you did something. You just get a rake and just rake in the carpet. They're going to think you, you vacuum. So I, she comes in, and the first thing she says is, oh, my gosh, the house looks amazing. So beautiful. You did such a good, I can't believe you vacuumed. It looks so good. It smells so good. Thank you so much. You're the best. This is awesome. And I'm just like, what happened? Because when I cut the grass, she didn't even notice it. I vacuumed the house, and it's like I'm husband of the year. Like, where was this reaction two years ago? No, I haven't let it go. I still remember. <laughs> Where was this? You know? But here's the thing. It's like cutting the grass is my responsibility. That's what I do. Like I cut the grass. Like, you, you know, we've talked about we're a team. So, so if something's lacking, the other one will pick it up. It's not like, oh, you got to do that. But I cut the grass because I don't want her to cut the grass. It's my deal. That's just what I do. If you like to cut the grass and you're a lady, that's perfectly fine. I just like to cut the grass for her. That's just our thing. She likes to vacuum in the house. I don't vacuum. So the fact that I cut the grass was not that big of a deal to her because I was supposed to do it anyways. But when I vacuumed, which is something I'm not really even supposed to do, it blew her mind and she appreciated it more. Because it was something I did not have to do, it meant more to her and it affected her response. See, this is the difference in everybody else in Luke 7 compared to Mary who brought the, the alabaster box. And it's the difference with the way a lot of us respond to Jesus. If we're honest, some of us take the love and the grace of Jesus for granted as if he had to do it. Mary came in bawling her eyes out because she knew that Jesus didn't have to do any of it. She knew, Jesus said, I'm in the same room. With the same people, everybody else. But everybody else expected me to do it. Mary appreciated it. See, the first thing I need you to see today is that there was an equal investment but an unequal return. Jesus had done the same thing for everybody in the room. 
He was headed to the same cross for everybody in the room. He was giving his life for everybody in the room. And Mary was the only one. Jesus says, I'm, I'm doing the same thing for everybody else. But Mary is the only one who actually showed appreciation for it. Everybody else was taking it for granted. And he tells it in a parable like this. He said in verse 42, neither of them had money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Both of them had debts forgiven, but both of them did not love him equally. Both of them had experienced the same thing, and it happened so easily. It happens so easily. We get so caught up in how bad everybody else needs Jesus. We get so caught up in how bad everybody else is. And how messed up everybody else is and the mistakes that everybody else has made. And we get so wrapped up in talking about how everybody else needs the grace of Jesus that we forget we need grace too. We get so caught up in talking about all the things that everybody else has done and how they need Jesus so much that we forget we need Jesus too. We need Jesus just as much as the next person. Jesus said, he said, it's, it's not just what I did for her, I've done it for everyone. This is why it's so easy for us to judge people instead of love people. Because we look at other people and we see their, their messed up life and we feel like they're worse than we are. But the truth is, we're all messed up. We all have issues. None of us have it 100% together. The reality is, if you don't need grace, if you don't need mercy, if you don't need forgiveness, then congratulations, you're Jesus. And the last time I checked, none of us were able to walk on water. I've seen some videos of people trying. I haven't seen anybody that's able to walk on water because nobody's Jesus. If you don't need grace and mercy and love and all of these things from Jesus, then you are Jesus and none of us are him. We all need the same thing that everybody else needs. We get into a competition of I'm less bad than that person, so I'm more holy than they are. I'm less bad than that person, so I deserve to be closer to Jesus than they do. No, Jesus said I'm for everyone. Everyone. Because in case you forgot, you had a debt that's been paid. You had something that, that was stuck with you that you couldn't pay, that you couldn't afford. No matter how much money you made, you could win six lotteries. You still can't pay it back. But God still loved you enough to sacrifice his life for you just like he did the woman down the street. It's the same grace. It's the same mercy for everyone. Jesus said, I'm in a room full of people that take me for granted. I'm in a room full of people that do not understand who I am and why I've done what I've done and why I do what I do and what I'm going to do. Romans 3.23, it says, all have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not a competition. We're all in the same boat. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all done the same thing. May not be the exact same thing, but we're all in the same boat. We all need Jesus just as much as the next person. Jesus, he looks and he says, he says, we, you're both equally forgiven, but only one of you returned to show thanks. You're equally forgiven, but one of you truly appreciated it more than the other. He said, which would love him more? They were both equally forgiven. But only one truly appreciated it. How did Jesus know? Because of the return of one. The return of one was greater. Mary came back crying. She came to Jesus crying hysterically at his feet because she understood her life was a mess. She understood how bad she needed Jesus. She was the only one who actually showed it. A room full of people, but Mary is the only one who actually showed it. Jesus was surrounded by people who would tell him, I love you, Jesus. I got your back, Jesus. I'll be your disciple, Jesus. I'll be there for you, Jesus. I'm thankful for you, Jesus. But Mary was the only one who actually showed it. 
She was the only one who was willing to come and to say, you know what, I got I to gotta return. I got to return on the investment that you've brought to me. I got to come and I've got to worship at your feet with everything that I've got. Because I know that without you, I am nothing. I know that without you, I am nothing. And Mary came back and she offered the most valuable thing that she possibly could. Laid it at Jesus' feet. And you think that I'm talking about the oil, but I'm not. You think I'm talking about the perfume, but I'm not. I'm talking about her pride. The pride that she had to lay down to come into a room full of people who hated her guts, who did not think she deserved to be there, who did not think she was worthy, who judged her, who talked about her. She came in front of all of them and she said, all of you are right. I don't care. I got to get to Jesus. What you said about me is true, but I don't care. I got to get to Jesus. Because guess what? You can talk about me all day, but you can't fix my problems. You can say what you want all day, but you can't make my issues go away. So I've got to do what i got to do. i got to lay my pride down and get to the only one who can solve this issue called myself. And she came to Jesus. And some of us, the, the, the only thing that is holding us back from truly laying everything at the feet of Jesus is our pride. Some of us, the only thing that is holding us back from true, total surrender to Jesus is our pride. Because we're afraid of what everybody else is going to think. Or because we think that we're going to figure it out on our own. Or we think we don't even need to. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I asked for forgiveness. Now I'm good. Now I'm golden. And Jesus says, no, every day you need me. Every day. Every day. We used to sing this song, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. But now with days we, we feel like, we, we've done one thing. If, if I come to church once a month, then I've paid my due and I can do whatever I want for the rest of the month. And Jesus says, no, you need me every day. It's not about what we do once or twice. It's about what we do consistently. Consistently. Consistently saying, Jesus, without you, I am nothing. Without you, I don't even know how I'd be here today. I don't even know how I would make it, how I could keep going. This lady, she comes to him and she says, Jesus, I've got to lay down at your feet. I've got to wash your feet because my life is a mess. And, and I'm losing this battle called life. I'm losing it. And it's not lost on me. I understand. I'm losing this battle called life. But Jesus changed everything. And that's why she prays the way that she prays. This is why you cannot judge people for praising the way that they praise. You cannot judge people for worshiping the way that they worship. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know about the time that they were laying on their bedroom floor at 2 o'clock in the morning crying out, not knowing who they were crying out to, but they knew they needed something different in their life. And Jesus loved them enough to meet them in that point. That's why they praise the way they do. We judge people for praising crazy ways or quiet ways or whatever ways they want to praise. Let them do them because they are thankful in their life for what God's done and they're reflecting that in their praise. You can't judge somebody for worshiping the way. That, there's no such thing as worshiping too quiet. No such thing as worshiping too loud. No such thing as worshiping too crazy, too timid. You worship the way that you worship as long as you're worshiping him. That's all that matters can't judge people for praising the way that they praise you don't know what they've been through you don't know their story you don't know why they're so excited about Jesus you don't know why they're so thankful about Jesus you don't know why they can't step into the building without just crying under the presence of God because they remember when everyone told them that nobody loved them and then they found out Jesus did you don't know the story so we can't be judging people for praising the way that they praise and doing what they do and don't miss this Mary was in a room full of people a room full of people, kind of, kind of like this, except they weren't in a service. They were just hanging out with Jesus. She's in a room full of people, but she's the only one who truly acknowledged Jesus. She's the only one. Everybody else in the room was totally aware of what was going on, but they were painfully unaware of Jesus being in the room. Next thing I need you to see is they were painfully unaware. There was an unequal return, but then they were painfully unaware. It said in verse 44, then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. I came into your house 
and you did not give me any water for my feet. They all had access to the same thing. But only Mary seized the moment. They all, Jesus was in the room with all of them, but Mary was the only one who understood the awe of the moment. Mary was the only one who understood the importance of the moment. I'll put it to you like this. Everybody else was so focused on what they could get from Jesus, Mary was focused on the worship she could bring to Jesus. Everybody else was so focused. And, and many of us, myself included, are guilty of the same thing. We, we think so much more about what we can get from Jesus than how we can worship Jesus. We think so much, we spend so much more time thinking about what we can get from Jesus than we do worshiping Jesus. It's like, Jesus, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. While you're at that, I need you to also do this. Now, I know this is on the same day. I know your calendar is kind of busy, right, because, like, we're, we're believing for some great things. So I need you to, I don't know if you can't, can you do two things on the same day, Jesus? Like, if you could do that, that'd be great. If not, I might not be at church on Sunday, but it's okay. I'll catch you back on the next Sunday once you get back on my level of doing what I need you to do. And it's quiet because everybody knows it's true. Spend so much more time thinking about what can I get from Jesus instead of the worship that we can bring Jesus. And we're painfully unaware of his presence. We're painfully unaware. Don't get so obsessed with the gift that you miss out on the giver. Don't get so obsessed with the gift that you want to receive that you overlook the one who's actually bringing the gift in the first place. I, I, I don't, we went to a party, a birthday party, a one-year-old birthday party, my favorite thing. And, um, and, and we, gave, we gave a gift. And I apparently had stepped out of the room when the gift was open. And so I came back in, I was like, they were like done opening gifts. I was like, hey, babe, they didn't open our gift. She was like, yeah, they did. I was like, nobody told me thank you. I was just saying, like, nobody told me. Because, because when you give a gift, you don't want somebody getting so focused on the gift that they forget about the giver. Let me give you another example. Christmas morning, Judah's one year old. He don't know any better. But it's Christmas morning, and we had this little fake drum set out in front of the Christmas tree. And he comes running out all excited and runs right past me and starts playing the drums. I'm like, your budget for next Christmas has gone down the drain, son. <laughs> you have no budget anymore. Runs right past me straight to the gift. Now, he's one. He knows no better. But what I'm saying is a lot of times we do the same thing. We pray and we cry out and we spend months and we get, we get prayer chains going. I mean, we're calling the church. We're getting people plugged in. We're getting all these people praying for the same thing. God finally does it. We run straight to what he brought our way and completely forget to thank him. We go online and we post about what we got and completely forget to say, look what God has done. Look what Jesus has done. Without him, this isn't possible. We get so obsessed with the gift that we forget the giver. And it's affecting how we worship because we're focused on the wrong things. And we're painfully unaware of his presence. For some of us, we used to worship so extravagantly. Oh, extravagant, I don't know what that was, but it's extravagant. <laughs> So extravagantly. But then somewhere along the line, we, we forgot. Somewhere along the line, we, we forgot. And, and it affects our levels of worship. Some of us have different levels of worship. Like we can come in on a Sunday when we got a raise on our job. And it's like, there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Hi! Break every chain. Yay! The chain of my boss's stupidity for looking me over for all those years. In the name of Jesus, there is power. Come in. On the Sunday, you lose your job, and it's like, there's power. Jesus. Chains. Chains. My life is full of chains. Yeah. <laughs> we have these different levels. But can I submit to you that he's just as much in the room and worthy of your praise on the days you get a raise as he is when you lose your job? 
can I submit to you that he's just as much in the room and worthy of your praise when you're encouraged as he is when you're discouraged? Mary came in and she said, I, I, my life's a wreck. I, I don't care. I don't have things together. My, I, my act is not together. But I have to worship Jesus. I have to get to his feet. I have to lay down. I cannot overlook the importance of this moment of worshiping the one who loves me when everybody else is busy judging me. Everybody else is busy hating on me, talking about me, saying all these things. But Jesus loves me, and I have to get to his feet. My life isn't perfect. Far from it, but I have to get there. Jesus is not waiting for you to figure it out before you worship. He's waiting on you to worship before you ever get there. She's like, my life is not perfect, but i got to get there, and I've got to worship. May we as a church become more aware. May we as a church not wait until the music moves us before we move. May we as a church step onto the parking lot singing his praise. Come into the building singing his praise. If you would step into the building worshiping God, you'd be amazed how much different your experience would be in God's house. If you didn't wait until the, the third song kicks in to really start to, you know, start to get it going, you'd be amazed how much different your worship experience would be. Because this is what we do a lot of times. It's like, how was church? Eh. It's all right, you know, I mean, I didn't really love the first song. Second song got me in there a little bit. Third song, you know, they kind of took, it was a little bad. And then Pastor Dustin, I don't know, you know, I, I know he's fixing to have a second child. Maybe he's already stressed and losing sleep about it. But that message, I don't know where he was at on that. It was pretty awful. So, yeah, I didn't really get much from church today. But, you know, it's okay. It's what we, it's what we do. But you get out of it what you put into it. And, and uh, I mean, it's not lost on me. I do the same thing. I tell Nicole, I can't, it's hard for me to go to other church services because I'm sitting in there the whole time. I'm thinking about, okay, now maybe we could do this at the church. And, and, and maybe, well, maybe they shouldn't do that. Maybe they need to do that because, you know, it's like kind of what I do for a living as well. And, and so I have to remind myself every time I go to a house of worship that this is special. This is special. I'm not here just to try to get ideas and try to take things and try to criticize. I'm here to have a moment with Jesus. I'm here, to, I'm here to worship Jesus. Church has become too commercialized where we're trying to judge and pick everything and put everything together and trying to build the perfect church. But there is no perfect church without Jesus. And there is no perfect church without us coming in and saying, I, I, I've had a week from hell. I don't like what my marriage is looking like. I don't like how my children are acting. I don't like what my bank, that don't exist anymore, my bank account. So now, but I'm coming to worship anyways. I'm coming to lift up his name anyways. It doesn't matter if they sing three songs I hate. And if there's a guest speaker, I'm still having the best Sunday yet. This is why I always like to say it's going to be the best Sunday yet. Because you get out of it what you put into it. If you come in expecting somebody to have to make you move before you move, that's what you're going to get. But if you step into the building saying, I'm coming with the praise. I'm coming to do battle. I'm coming to take the enemy's head off. I'm coming to shout so loud that he knows he's in trouble. Even though everything's caving in around me, I'm going to shout anyways. That's what you get. When you come in expecting the best Sunday yet, that's what you get. That's what you get. We worship so extravagantly. All these amazing things. Y'all thought I was going to do it again. I'm not. My little dance move. You know. we, we used to worship so extravagantly. But then it's like we, we forgot about the awe. Now we're painfully unaware of his presence. Like some of us, we don't even remember the last time that we felt in our heart the Holy Spirit moving. So we don't even remember the last time that we wept uncontrollably. And his, no explanation. Why are you crying? I don't know. Just so thankful. God is so good. Yeah, but your marriage is falling apart. But God is so good. Yeah, but you just had to company just got bankrupt. But God is so good. It's just his presence because of who he is, not because of what he's done. See, you're getting it messed up. It's not about what he's done or what he's doing. It's about who he is, where we just wept under the goodness of God, where we just wept uncontrollably because of who he is, where we said, God, it doesn't matter what you do or what you don't do. 
but I'm going to worship you. I'm going to worship. Where we don't come to church just to try to see what we can get out of it, but where we are so excited to come to church just to worship together. Just to lift up his name because of who he is. Why do I worship? Not because of what he, I, I want him to do for me. That's manipulation. Make sure that you're not manipulating God. Make sure that you are worshiping God. Nobody wants to be manipulated. My worship is not a manipulation tool. My worship is an act of worship. <laughs> Say, God, have you never did another thing? Just thankful for who you are. You can tell that you've become painfully aware when you, when you stop telling other people about it. Because when you're amazed by something, when you're in awe of something, you can't help but tell other people about it. Stranger Things, season three, just came out on Netflix this week. Some of y'all are like, I don't even know what that is. It's okay. It's on Netflix. That's all you need to know. And it's like, I found myself, I hadn't even watched it yet. And all I've been talking about is Stranger Things. And God's like, yo, hey, here I am. Because like, we, we get so caught up. When was the last time that the first thing you told somebody about was Jesus instead of your favorite Netflix show to binge? When was the last time that you were in so much awe that, that you just couldn't have a conversation? I'm not saying you run with a Bible and hit somebody in the head. I'm just saying, when was the last time? Do people do that? No. But maybe, oh, no, never mind. But when was the last time that, like, you just were so overwhelmed with the goodness of God that it just, it wasn't even, it just overflowed into your conversation. It just overflowed into your life got to get to the point where we're in so much awe that we can't help but talk about the goodness of God. And last thing I need you to see is we can't underestimate the power of valuable worship. Can't underestimate the power of valuable worship. Jesus said it like this. He said, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Jesus said, why does she worship? The way that she worships. Because her sins have been forgiven. How can you tell that she's been forgiven? How can you tell? He said, because of her worship. See, we worship what we value. So when we fail to worship Jesus, it reveals that we don't value Jesus. And I'll take it a step further. When our level of worship is dictated by whether or not Jesus does what we want him to do, that reveals that we don't worship him, we worship it. When we're worshiping greater when he does great things than we are when he doesn't, we're not worshiping him, we're worshiping it. Am I saying to stop believing for great things? No. We're believing for amazing things in our house as a church. We are believing for some huge things. We are believing for God to provide us with a building that we can go to with a parking lot that can house more people to spread the gospel. Things that we cannot do on our own. Things that quite frankly we probably can't even afford, but God can. We're believing for some great things. In our house individually, Nicole and I are believing for some amazing things. I'm not saying you don't believe for amazing things. I'm just saying we have to ask ourselves one question. If God never did another thing for me, would I still worship him? If God never moved another mountain, if he never won another battle, if he never killed another devil, if he never did another thing for me, would I still worship him? Because it's so easy to do, y'all. It is so easy to get it confused and to think that we are valuing Jesus. To think that we value the source when in reality we value the resource. It is so easy to think that we have our hands lifted high in worship because we're worshiping Him but we're really worshiping the house he just gave us. And if we get foreclosed on, then he's no longer worthy of worship. And this is why a lot of us get into to struggles because when the battle comes, when the attack comes, we stop worshiping. If we ever got a foreclosure notice, you know what I would do? God, I worship you. God, I thank you. I, I don't know. 
I don't know how it's going to be handled. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know the answer. I don't know the solution. But God, I thank you that you allowed us to be here as long as we have. God, you didn't have to let us have two months in this house. You didn't have to let us have this car for a year. God, we thank you for what you've done. We worship you. And if you will worship him in those moments, if you will worship him throughout, you'll be amazed to see the miracles that God can still do. When the enemy's trying to tell you that it's over and that it's foreclosed and that it's closed and that it's canceled and there's no chance, if you'll continue to worship him, God will show up in the midnight hour. God will show up when everybody else said it can't happen. God will show up when everybody else told you it was over but you've got to worship him because of who he is why do I worship I worship him because he loved me enough to send Jesus if he didn't do another thing for me the fact that he loved me enough to send his son down on this earth to die to rise again for me worthy of all my worship all my worship Why do I worship the way that I worship? If we can answer the why, then it can affect the what. If we can answer why we do what we do, then it'll affect what God is able to do.